All right, so now we are moving on to local area networks. So at the I network layer, we had IP addresses, you know, 32 bit IP address, network layer address for interface, used for layer three network layer forwarding. For example, you know, we represent them with four uh, integers and we talk about IP version four, right? In MAC addresses, we will use hexadecimal notation. So MAC, this is the most preferred uh, name, but it, people also refer to as local area network or physical or Ethernet address. But MAC is known by everybody, so we, we are going to use the name MAC. So function is this, used locally to get frame from one interface to another physically connected interface. Same subnet in IP addressing sense, right? So in this case, instead of layer three, we communicated layer two. So uh, we have to have a way of addressing them. So we use 48 bit MAC address for most local area networks. Burned in, you know, your, in your network adapter ROM, also sometimes software setable. So ID is as follows. Initially, we want them to be unique, right? So every manufacturer actually puts their unique MAC address to their device. So question is, if there are many different manufacturers all around the world and they're choosing this randomly, why there isn't any collisions? Actually, you pay a small fee to IEEE and buy a range for your devices, like 24 bit range. So this way you can uh, produce thousands of devices uh, with different MAC address. So for this reason, uh, just by looking at the first part of a MAC address, you can determine which company it was produced by, okay, which manufacturer. But uh, we also say that now it is software setable. Actually, we can create collisions, right? And actually, in most uh, modern routers, you can manually modify your MAC address. Also, with the software, you can, you know, on Linux or Windows, it doesn't matter, you can manually change your MAC address. So, again, here, this will be the question. You know, in IP addresses, everybody has a unique IP address. Now, I'm talking about two devices having the same MAC address. So, wouldn't it be a problem? The thing is that if you are not in the same subnet, it wouldn't be a problem. Having a same MAC address on a device in Turkey and in a device in Germany wouldn't cause any problem because at that part, you are going to communicate with IP level. In the same network, if you have this two devices connected in the same switch with the same MAC address, this would cause a problem. But what will be the problem depends on the uh, devices, okay? And how you implemented these protocols. So here's an example, as you can see, 48 bits are shown by six bytes in hexadecimal notation. Okay, so every character here represents four bits, actually. So this is one byte, eight bits, and so on. All right, so each interface on local area network has unique 48-bit MAC address, has a locally unique 32-bit IP address, as we have seen before. So we have both addresses in terms of you know, MAC and IP. So assume that they are connected in the same local area network. So a MAC address allocation administered by IEEE, as I mentioned, uh, manufacturer buys portion of MAC address space to assure uniqueness. Analogy, MAC addresses are like social security numbers, IP addresses like postal addresses. So, you know, it is like unique to the device. But this is why, you know, having the ability to change it actually a good thing for anonymity, because if you same, use the same device with the same MAC address, you know, for instance, in your laptop, you travel the world, you try to connect the Wi-Fi, or even if you don't connect, you broadcast sometimes your information. So this way, actually, you can be traced. So actually, just turn on your Wi-Fi in your mobile phone, go to a different country, so you don't know any Wi-Fi password of the Wi-Fi there, but just walk along, for instance, in a street in New York, so actually, they can trace which path you took just by looking at your MAC address, okay? So this is why Apple and some other companies allow you to, you know, randomly generate a MAC address every time you connect and that kind of stuff. MAC flat address portability can move interface from one LAN to another. 
recall IP address not portable depends on IP subnet to which node is attached. So this allows you to travel around. ARP, address resolution protocol. So this is the thing that we want to talk about. Question is how to determine interfaces MAC address knowing its IP address. So assume that devices are connected like here. ARP table is each IP node host router on local area network has table, okay? So they have the table here, IP MAC address mapping for some local area nodes. So it is like this IP address MAC TTL. TTL is generally, I think, 20 minutes, I guess. So it, it is updated because, you know, if somebody leaves the, uh, you know, connection, uh, you don't have to keep it in your table for a very long time. Yes, TTL time to leave, time after which address mapping will be forgotten, typically 20 minutes. Actually, in some cases in hospitals and so on, this is set as one day. So if you're a patient, you connect to the system, your password given to you. So they record that MAC address just for one day. So next day, you realize that you are not connected to the Wi-Fi. You have to re-enter your password and so on. So example, A wants to send datagram to B in this picture. B's MAC address is not in A's ARP table. So A uses ARP to find B's MAC address. So since you don't know it, you have to broadcast and learn it, right? So this is the thing. Actually, this is the thing that you use Wireshark to listen to communication as well. So in this picture, A is ARP table like this. Okay, so first step is as follows. A broadcasts ARP query containing B's IP address. Destination MAC address, since you don't know B's MAC address, you fill it with all ones. So 48 ones turn into FFs in this hexadecimal notation. So this datagram actually broadcasts to all of the devices in the subnet. So all nodes on local area network receive ARP query. Yes. As you can see, Ethernet frame sent to FFF, but here you have your source MAC, since you have a MAC and IP again source and target IP address and you broadcast it. Second, B hears this request ARP and replies to A with ARP response, giving its MAC address. So this time, you know, you already send know the MAC address of A, but you include your uh, MAC address. Now A hears this and puts inside the MAC address of this IP address. Now from this point on, whenever A wants to send frame to this IP address, A knows where B is, right? Because they know the MAC address and the IP address. So let's see it in the another, routing to another subnet, so addressing. So in this case, A is here and B is here. So focus on addressing at IP datagram and make layer frame levels. Here, all of the devices have IP addresses and MAC addresses. But the important thing is that since this router is connected to both subnets, recall that it has two IP addresses and two MAC addresses according to these subnets. And since uh, A wants to sense the message, A knows B's IP address, A knows IP address of the first up router, A knows R's MAC address, Okay. Then actually you're sending A sends the destination as this IP source and destination. Okay. So here this as you can see source IP is the uh, IP address of this router in this subnet and destination in this part. Okay. And MAC destination is as you can see MAC of this part. So you might ask why A doesn't send it to this MAC address because it is not included in its R table. Because since the IP address range is not in this range, it wouldn't put it inside the R table. So this is why you write this MAC address. But rather will, you know, convert it to this one when it's sending the data. So frame sent from A to R. Frame received at R, datagram removed, passed up to IP, right? Now the source and this destination address are 
change like this. R determines outgoing interface, passes datagram with IP source A, destination B to link layer. Right. Now, if you want me to go back, initially, IP source was the source of this A, and IP destination was here, the B, sorry. But make destination was this one. So at this part, source and IP address are this. But now make source and destination is changed, right? Now make destination is the destination of B, and make source is this part of this subnet because B knows this MAC address, but not this one because this IP is not in this subnet. So R creates link layer frame containing A to B IP datagram. Frame destination address B is MAC address. Transmits link layer frame. So B receives this and you know, moves up to the IP protocol, right? Extracts IP datagram, paces datagram up protocol stack to IP. Right, so let's move on to Ethernet protocol. This is the dominant wired local area network terminology, technology, sorry, first widely used local area network technology, simpler, cheap. There are many actually proposed variants, but Ethernet was the you know, winner because it received many updates. Initially, it wasn't as fast as this. I think the first introduced one, Metcalf, I think it was like 2.54 megabits per second, but they updated as the 10 megabit per second as the first standard. Nowadays, depending on your uh, network adapter and your cables, you can reach up to 400 gigabits per second. Single chip multiple speeds, like you know, uh, like the adapter from Broadcore. So the physical topology is as follows: bus popular through mid 90s, all nodes in same collision domain can collide with each other. So bus with coaxial cable. This is why we talk about multiple access because there are collisions. But nowadays we have so in this case for let me go back. In this scenario, if you turn on Wireshark, actually you can listen to all of the communication of all of the nodes. But now that we have switched uh, link layer two uh, devices, uh, we actually don't broadcast anymore. So each spoke runs a separate Ethernet protocol. Nodes do not collide with each other. So this will be clear in a minute. So in the switch scenario, we are all connected to a switch. Probably the switch is connected to a router and so on. But uh, when this uh, computer wants to send data to this one, so maybe in the pictures, no. So actual switch knows that uh, the MAC address of this device belongs to this port. So they know they only transmit through here and don't send the data to unrelated nodes. Okay. Sending interface encapsulates IP datagram or other network layer protocol packet in Ethernet frame. So you have the payload here. Cyclic redundancy check here. Preamble, use the synchronized receiver, sender clock rates. So you repeat actually seven bytes of this, followed by this byte. So this way devices are synchronized. You know, here we are at the hardware level, so we have to be synchronized. So you have the preamble, then destination address and source address. Of course, here we are talking about MAC addresses. Right. So yes, uh, this is six by source destination MAC addresses. If adapter receives frame with matching destination address or with broadcast address, for example, R packet, it passes data in frame to network layer protocol. Otherwise, adapter discards frame. Type indicates higher layer protocol, mostly IP, but others possible, for example, novel IPX, Apple Talk, etc. used to demultiplex up at receiver. Yes, CRC is the cyclic redundancy check at receiver. If error detected, the frame is dropped. So as you can see, Ethernet is unreliable and connectionless. No handshaking between sending and receiving NICs. This is why it is fast, actually. Unreliable. Receiving network adapter doesn't send acknowledgments or NICs to sending NIC. 
Okay, so this way you don't know if it is received, acknowledged, etc. So data in drop frames recovered only if initial sender uses higher layer RDT like TCP. Otherwise, drop data lost. So this is why UDPs get lost, but TCP doesn't. Ethernet made protocol unslotted CSMA with collision detection with binary backoff, which we talked in the previous slides. So there are many different Ethernet standards, common MAC protocol and frame format in all of them, but they allow different speeds starting from two megabits to you know, 40 gigabits per second. So there are like, uh, as you can see, names like this. So this actually, for instance, 100 represents 100 megabits per second and so on. Yes, in this case, these are cover twisted pair physical layer. These ones use fiber physical layers. This is why it generally starts with F and here it starts with T, but of course there are many standards. Yes, switches. This is the important part for us. Switch is a link layer device, takes an active role, store forward Ethernet frames, examine incoming, examine incoming frames, MAC address, selectively forward frame to one or more, outgoing links when frame is to be forwarded on segment. Again, uses CSMA with collision detection to access segment. Transparent, host unaware of presence of switches. So generally you don't know if you are connected to a switch or not, right? You simply, you know, plug your Ethernet cable to your network adapter and use it. Plug and play, self-learning. Switches do not need to be configured. This is the good thing for the IT personnel, you don't have to deal with all of these MAC addresses of ARP tables and so on. It is automatic. So hosts have dedicated direct connection to switch. Switch is buffer packets, Ethernet protocol used on each incoming link. So no collisions, right? Full duplex. Each link is its own collision domain. So here there are you know, six interfaces. Switching, you know, A to A prime and B to B prime can transmit simultaneously without collision because we are using different links. But A to A and C A to A prime and C to C prime cannot happen simultaneously, right? Because the link here is shared in this scenario. So how does switch know A? prime reachable via interface four, B prime reachable via interface five. Each switch has a switch table. Each entry, MAC address of host, interface to reach host timestamp looks like a routing table. How are entries created, maintained in switching table? Something like a routing protocol. Yeah, so as you can see, switch learns which host can be reached through which interfaces. This is why we call it actually a, in a plug and play system that you don't need to, as an IT person, don't need to do it. It's a self-learning system. So here source is a destination, a prime. So switch has, you know, interface like this, MAC address and interface and time to leave. Initially it is empty. When frame received, switch learns location of sender incoming land segment, right? Because now it A knows, that I mean, switch knows that A is at the interface one. So it puts A, MAC, MAC address of A and interface one and provides time to leave, depends on the switch. And so it records in this table. Now it needs to know where the A prime is. So record incoming link, MAC address of sending host, index switch table using MAC address, MAC destination address. If entry found for destination, then destination or segment from which frame arrived, drop frame. This is important because I mean, if uh, I mean, if the source and the destination is identical, it drops here. Otherwise, forward frame on interface indicated by entry. Else, flood forward on all interfaces except arriving interface to you know find a prime and put it inside the table. So we start with this. Now it doesn't know where the A prime is. So A prime location unknown. So you flood, meaning that you actually send everybody packet to see where they are. So destination A location, no. Selectively send on just one link. 
Okay, sorry. So it learns that A prime is at four. So this way now it can send the data. Self-learning switches can be connected together. This is the good thing. So sending from A to G, how does S1 knows forward frame destined to G via S4 and S3? Self-learning works exactly the same as in single switch case. This is why it is plug and play and you know we don't deal with this kind of problems. So in this example, C sends frame to I and I response to C. So small institution network actually works like this. You have switches in many departments and they are connected to another switch. Then it is connected to a router and you leave the, to the outside world like this. So in small companies, this works, but of course for a big university, you need to have more routers than this. So switches versus routers, both are store and forward. Routers, network layer devices, examine network layer headers. Switches, link layer devices, examine link layer headers. So they don't deal with the upper layers. This is the actually the initial picture at the beginning of this course we talk about. So switch works on the link layer. Router works also at the network layer. Both have forwarding tables. Routers compute tables using routing algorithms, IP addresses. Switches learn forwarding table using flooding learning MAC addresses. So that's the difference, okay? 